All right, everyone. Welcome to Tiger Talk Thursday. This is episode 38, and our guest today is Helen Stumbos. Stumbos, did I pronounce it right? That's good. Perfect. <laughs> There's nothing worse than butchering someone's name. So um, for those good. of you... Yeah, thank you. Okay, so for those of you that are new to the series, this is all about transitioning to life after sport, uh, whether it be due to injury, unforeseen circumstances, or retirement that forces you to hang up the jersey. Um, we have athletes coming around in from all around the globe um, in order to help those suffering in silence. So I'll give you a brief intro to our wonderful guest today. So Helen, as a Hall of Fame Canadian national team soccer athlete, has learned many lessons competing on the world stage. Lessons that impacted her soccer career, but also translated into all aspects of her life. Helen was a member of Canada's national soccer team for eight years and was a key member of Canada's first ever World Cup team in 1995, where she went on to score Canada's first ever, very important, first ever World Cup goal, male or female. Woo -woo. Although her career ended abruptly with a knee injury, she quickly transitioned into the broadcast TV world first as a commentator for women's soccer in Canada, and then as a partner in two successful media production companies. She has hosted and produced shows for many TV networks, including Fox Soccer USA, Goal, is that Gold TV? G-O-L TV? Gold TV? Gold TV. Gold that TV. was an old network here in Canada, yeah. <laughs> yeah, CBC, Sportsnet, and Malaysia TV. She has also worked with some prestigious organizations, Canadian Olympic Committee, FIFA, Dive Canada, Athletics Canada, and Canada Sports Hall of Fame, to name a few. Today, Helen is the president and CEO of The Good Games, Canada's biggest festival of sport, which is so cool. Wait till you guys hear more about this. And it's an event that brings together two of Helen's passions, competitive sport and celebrating sport for life and sport for, for all. Not to mention, she is also the president and one of the founders of the Canadian Women's Soccer Alumni Association. Woo! What a rap sheet! <laughs> Welcome! <laughs> Thank you for joining Did us. I yeah. Thanks you for did. having me. Isn't it funny when you hear we do your look bio? like sisters though? I know. We do look like sisters. I know. I swear, when you said that the other day, I was like, oh my God, we totally do. I know. <laughs> and it's funny when I hear you speak, I resonate with so much of who you are. So I'm so, thank you so much for taking the time from your busy schedule to join this conversation that is near and dear to my heart. Um, let's go back to, oh, we, you're, you need to update your bio to say you're a TEDx speaker too, Missy. It's not. Oh yeah. Yeah. I don't think about that. Eh? But <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. For those of you, if you are a TEDx um, fan like myself, there's a TEDx talk called Destination Happy that Helen has given. That is a great talk. And we will talk a little bit about that. Let's go back to your younger playing years. Um, one thing that really stood out to me was that pivotal point when you were released from the team and how that just catapulted you to that next level of playing. And it's so important because I feel like as athletes, there's so many times that we feel like we're being rejected and it's like more of a redirection. So let's go back to your younger playing years and then we'll get into the transitioning to life after sport. Sure. I think that, um, I mean, it's such a great experience and I think it's such a great testament to the power of mind for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, one of the struggles and I, I love sharing this because I think so many people think as athletes and we've had, you know, a decent career, people think we've had all this confidence and, you know, it's been, I mean, hard work, but you know, it just naturally progresses. Um, but I, uh, I don't know what happened, but when I made the national team, for some reason, I just, this flip in my confidence, um, cause I was, you know, captain of my team here. I always did really well, did well at university, but for some reason, when I made it on the national team, it was like this shift. And I, all of a sudden just felt like I wasn't good enough. And I remember my dad coming to practices and I would sit there and I'd be like, oh my God, dad, like, look at Charmaine Hooper. Oh my God, she's so good. And look at this player. And he'd be like, well, you know, you're just as good as them. And I'd be like, oh no, 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 I'm mm -hmm. not. No way. I'm not as good as them. I mean, it was so um, debilitating. Like I literally was having panic attacks and I remember going to play in the world university games. Uh, oh no, sorry. We're we were playing in, uh, yeah, I think it was the world university games. We were playing China in the semifinals and it was here in Hamilton. And, um, I was a starter on the team and it was weird. I made it on the team. I was a starter from the minute I made it on the team. So, I mean, it's kind of weird that I had this issue, but I did massively. And the night before the China game, I remember this so clearly because I, I literally would turn off my light. I was, I had a roommate at the time. I turn off my light soon as I turn off my light, I was having like massive panic attacks. So I'd have to turn on my light. I'd read a little bit, calm myself down, turn off my light, panic, 
tax. So I, I didn't sleep the whole night and I thought, oh my God, my roommates could think I'm totally nuts. <laughs> um, but I was just, I would go out to practices and I remember looking around and looking at the other players and thinking, what's wrong with me? Like, why are they so confident? And why am I like struggling with this? And so anyway, I'd been on the team 92, 93, 94, and then 95 was the world cup, um, world cup year. And we all got together in Hamilton for training camp. Um, and uh, it was the first week. And after the first week, the coach was going to be selecting the team. And uh, she comes up to me after the end of the week. And I'd been a starter up until this point. And she basically tells me I didn't make the team. And, you know, it's funny because I, I, I tried to think about what I was feeling in that moment. I was like, part of me was, I felt like it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. I was like, oh, yeah, I was right. I wasn't good enough to make this team. And then part of me was also not happy, obviously, because I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, why am I not making the team? I've been a starter all this time. And she basically tells me, um, you know, keep coming to training camp in case someone get in, gets injured before we go on our first trip, which was going to France. And, you know, before World Cup, we always did these these trips where you would have these exhibition games all over the place. And and so I kept training with the team, which is a little bit awkward because I was I came back to Guelph. So I was driving into Hamilton. They were all staying together. So I was like the odd man out, you know, driving in, coming to practice, leaving. I wasn't part of the team, really coming back home, then going back to the team. And then I think right before they left for France, we had an injury on the team and she was like, okay, well, you know, you can come back on the team for this little interim basis until the player gets better. And I, it was in France and I'll never forget it. You know, my sister knew what I was struggling with and she gave me a book called As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. It's a really fast read. It's an easy read. It's, it's a beautiful read. And I sat on this bus. I remember being on the bus in France and, and starting to realize like, it basically tells you that you can control your thoughts and, and you control what you're thinking. And that um, it's, it's so, so nicely written that I actually sat there and went, what do you mean I can control my thoughts? And I, it was such a huge uh, aha moment for me that I went, oh my God, it's not my dad or my coaches or anybody telling me this. It's me. And I remember thinking, you mean, why the hell am I doing this to myself? Like, why would I do this? And I made a, like, I made a decision right then and there that I was like, nope, nothing's going to control my thinking. I'm going to control my thinking. And then I went to play in France. I probably had one of the best tournaments and the coach came up to me at the end of that France tournament. And she was like, I don't know what happened to you, but the best <laughs> thing I ever did was cut you. And then I went on to be, you know, one of the top, that whole, that whole, um, up, leading up into the world cup. You know, I was one of the top players um, going into the World Cup. I was one of the top players. I was recruited in the world. It was so weird in the World Cup. I remember like we always had like Charmaine was the top player. Everybody knows she was always, you know, kind of the key player on our team. And and I remember the man's manager coming to me and saying there were coaches following me from game to game. They wanted me to go play in Europe or play and I was like they're coming to follow me like yeah. <laughs> so it was so weird because all of a sudden I became, you know, a, a you know, one of the pivotal players on the team and even if you watch the broadcast in the first game and you hear the commentator. So I literally, the shift, I love that the shift happened in a short period of time because it really shows that um, it wasn't like I got better. I didn't get, go home and get fit for three months. I didn't go home and train for another year. It was a matter of weeks where I went from, you know, being cut from the team to all of a sudden I was, you know, being sought after and recruited and one of the top players on the team. So it's so drastic that the only thing that yeah. changed was this. And that's I think cool. you touch on a really important topic. The confidence topic is one that I get sought out after a lot. You know, how do I help increase my child's confidence? But, and it is, it is a mental shift, but what I think is very important that athletes, for those of you that are listening in, um, we all, even now, after all this time and all this life experience, I still suffer from imposter syndrome, imposter syndrome. I still have moments of doubt. And then there's other times where I feel like I'm standing on the top of the mountain. And I can take the world. Right. And yeah. I think as humans, if we just realize, okay, <laughs> need to be, take a step back and be self-aware and under see where we're at in our headspace. And that's as quickly as you can take the blinders off and then you become super present in your current moment, right. And you get to go play. So that's really cool. And I do believe, um, you know, being cut almost like it's like dangling the carrot. It's like, here are your dreams. And you just, you either got a chance, you either got to shit or get off the pot or leave nothing to chance. And that kind of almost speeds you right into like the present moment. Right. It's like, I got nothing to lose here. Either we do it now or we don't do it ever. Right. So such a cool yeah, I think Bob, topic. Bob Proctor says there's two ways to change. It's an instant, like an instant um, emotional reaction or this rep repetition. And mm -hmm. I think in that instance, it was instant. just an instant emotional reaction where I was like, 
oh, I don't want to go through. I don't want to be cut again. I don't want to not make the team. So my instant reaction was to shift um, yeah. or you just do repetition by doing, you know, something consistently over and over. You can create change. I love that. Can you say that again for the listeners? That's two ways. It's either instant shift or over yeah, consistent so- time. Yeah. So Bob Proctor says there's two ways to make change in your life. And one is an instant emotional reaction. Usually sh- something big happens and you need to shift um, or it's just doing something repetitively over yeah. and over. And that creates change by doing the same thing over and over again. I love that. So for those that are listening, make sure that's key. What about, okay. So you go on, you have this amazing career, um, lots of self growth along the way. And I mean, you've done your resume is stacked. Um, let's talk about the knee injury, because obviously a lot of this topic is about life after sports. And what I find with injury, it's such an abrupt stop for athletes. It's not a chosen, um, stop. What was that experience like for you emotionally, mentally, and physically? Yeah, I think I didn't believe it at first. So I remember (laughs) I came home. Yeah. Like total denial. You have no idea. Like I was at camp in Vancouver. Um, I think they drained my knee and cortisoned it. Um, it wasn't doing anything. Um, it's a long story. I won't get into about what happened while we were there in training camp. But anyway, they, they said, well, you got to fly home and I got to go see my surgeon again. So I came home, I saw my surgeon, we booked a surgery right away. Cause in my head, I was like, well, they're going to do a quick cleanup and I'm going to make the world cup team again. Like that's in my head. Yeah. And so he, he does the surgery and he comes in my room after the surgery and he just shook his head and he's like, you know what? He's like, I opened up your knee and like everything came out and he's like, you're probably never going to run again, let alone play again. Like it's Mm. your knee is done. I still didn't believe it. Like I still, like that, that winner's mindset was like, yeah, yeah. You don't know. Oh my God. I was looking into like, okay, can I get a knee brace for, you know, basically I had was bone on bone. How can I get a knee brace? That'll help. I was on the ellipse machine. I was still training. I was like, no, I'm going to make the team. And then I was like, even the ellipse machine was like, super painful. <laughs> and, um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think I, I was like thinking, oh yeah, they're going to, they're, they're playing. I'm going to make the team. I'll come back and make the team. But then I was like, no, that's not happening. Uh, but I think at the time, the transition, what ended up happening was because I was, you know, the closest to the team at the time, um, the broadcast was including a female soccer player. I think it was the first time they were including a female soccer player on their broadcast. And so I made it onto the broadcast team, which was awesome because, you know, I was not able to play, but I was still able to be part of the team. Yeah. And I feel like um, at that point in time, it felt like that transition was um, softened a little bit more of because course, of course. instead of, you know, losing your career and then just yeah. being thrown into the, you know, into the wild and being like, well, what am I going to do now? I was like off the team, but you know, I still uh, kind of part of the team <laughs> and still yeah. able to go to games and talk to the players and, you know, talk about the players. And, you know, I was also hosting a soccer show. So I was still mm-hmm. really, really part of the soccer community. So it felt like I wasn't really, um, I didn't, I didn't get, you know, really thrown out there that hard. I got a soft landing in sort yep. of way, mm-hmm. probably wasn't for about seven years till all of that came to an end. Yeah. And that soccer stuff came to an end where I feel like my big transition happened. Yeah. And, um, and what was that like for you? Because I know we spoke about, um, you and you mentioned it in your TEDx talk. I mean, painting your walls yeah. brown. Was it brown? Dark yeah. or dark color of dark some brown. sort? Yeah. yeah. So what you was know what's going funny? on there? You don't, I don't, yeah, I don't think you realize kind of what you're dealing with. Like, I think in the moment, you just don't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was just, you know, there was so much crumbling at that time where, you know, I kind of, my broadcasting stuff was not as often. My soccer, the company I was running then was kind of, finishing and you know a relationship I was in was finishing so yeah. all of these kind of things kind of came kind of all together at once and and then you're then I was in a position where I I'm now looking back on it I was like who am I like yeah who is this person that's not part of these things that's been part of my life for since I was a kid um and so you know you go on a dark path of you know trying to figure that out and that dark path you can listen to on TEDx because it wasn't a fun path yeah but I wasn't good to myself that's probably the nice way of saying it um but so much so that like I I painted like you don't realize you're doing this but I painted oh I my yeah whole house. Yeah. You don't know you're doing it. It was because I just wanted to be in darkness. I didn't even know. And I remember like my sister would, you know, come and over and want to open my curtains or, you know, uh, want to talk to me. And I literally would be like, don't open my curtains. Like I was like the exorcist. <laughs> don't touch my curtains. I want it dark in here. Um, or she talked and I, I wouldn't even look at her when I talked because I just didn't, I didn't know how to didn't do it. Like, I didn't want her to see you either. 
yeah, I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to be part of anything. And, you know, you, then you go on this, you know, destructive phase where you just become very destructive. I think it's what's and- important though, is anyone listening athletes out there, we always see the accolades and we always see the successes, but we don't see the behind the scenes. And it, I want to humanize athletes, you know, sports are what you do. They're not who you are. And we still have to go through that identity shift and, and all those transitions. So thank you for, you know, being so raw and vulnerable and honest. I know it's not always easy, especially when you're someone who's a high achiever, it's hard to show when you're not feeling all together, but I so relate with looking in the mirror one time and being like, who are you? Like, I couldn't even connect with the girl that used to be so driven and, and, you know, like just making every wrong saying I'm that one thing and making every choice that is completely opposite. Um, just, yeah, not being good to myself as well. What was, so when you're going through that, how, what was the light to come coming back out? Because as we know, life is like this, but what for you was the moment where you kind of, Kurt David said this in our interview and he goes, you kind of just get tired of losing. And then it's kind of like that winner kind of crawls back up again out of you. But what was that for you and your experience? Sure. I think, um, I think it just got to a place where I was really bad. And my, I remember my sister coming over and I was lying down and I was crying and I just said, I don't know who I am anymore. And that was what I felt like. I was just like, I don't know who I am anymore. And again, I, you know, books have been my savior. I've, I've, I've got a, my mm-hmm. whole bookshelf is full of self-help books. And I, I got in, I was like, I have two choices right now. I can continue on this path and this destructive path and potentially not make it, yeah. <laughs> or I can decide to make a change. And, and um, I made a decision right then that I had to make a change and I didn't know how, um, but I was reading this book and I remember this book took me through like all of the, it was like a wheel of, you know, all the categories in your life of like families, friends, like um, extracurricular activities, financial and all. And you rated yourself between one, zero and wheel 10. Wheel of life. And yeah. Was, yeah. And I was like zero to two on everything. Like everything I was, you could see, I was just in a bad place. Yeah. And then I flipped the page and the next page basically said, what is one thing you can do? One thing tomorrow to help, to help you. And I was like, and it's so funny. Um, I remember sitting there thinking, well, geez, what is that one thing that makes me happy? And it's really sad that it was so hard to come to that idea of what is it? And I think that's a sad in general. We should all know what makes us happy. Uh, That's why I called my talk destination happy because I think everything starts with what makes you happy. And so I literally sat there and I was soul searching going, what makes me happy? What makes me happy? And I thought, okay, I'm an athlete. I need to play sport. I need to be around a social group that plays sport. Mm-hmm. And in that minute, I was like, okay, what can I do? I can play volleyball. Like I used to play volleyball in high school. I loved it. I can't play soccer because I can't twist and turn, but I could still play volleyball. And and I think the universe conspires to make things happen sometimes. But uh, there was a you know a co-ed volleyball league here. I called them up. And at first they're like, oh, we, we already filled our spots. There's no spots. Then I got a call a week later saying, Hey, guess what? We have a spot yeah. for a setter. Cause I'm obviously not going to be a hitter. I'm five foot two and a half. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, I made it onto that league and that led to, you know, joining a big group of people led to beach volleyball in the summers. And it led to my circle of friends. And it, it started with a very small snowball and then it grew and it grew. And, and now I would say a big group of my friends are my volleyball friends. It's the people I, I met. That. I just needed to be back in that setting that made me happy. And that filtered to every phase of my life. You could see that it helped all areas of my life. And um, it was just one decision to do one thing t- to make one change. And that's what started the the snowball uh, growing. It was crazy. It just takes one thing. But- hard. You know, it's funny. I asked, I know when friends are going through trouble and I'll ask them that I was like, what's one thing that makes you happy. And it's amazing how hard that is to figure out when you're in a really crappy place. And it's true. Um, so, and I think know, that's I- where we need to be compassionate and give ourselves grace. Right. It's like, we're human. It's like, I don't know where we decided we had to be perfect or where that came from the pressure society, social media, who knows all the filters, whatever, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but humanizing yeah. the athletes, I think is such a huge need in sports, but that I'm so happy to hear you. Um, you got back into it. And that's a big one that we've touched upon with other athletes, you know, the importance of that community piece, which is so key because yes, there's a lot of conversations out there about 
bettering ourselves. And that sounds very individual, but it's true. If you don't have the confidence or the belief, you got to do the work on yourself, the mindset work. And it's funny. Um, one of the other athletes that I've interviewed this week, he was talking about his NHL and he was talking about the mindset work that he did, had done from a, a young age. So athletes, parents, if you are listening, you know, when kids are in the car, instead of grilling them, have them listen to a, a 10 minute podcast or my, on a mindset shift, to help them learn to open up their ways of thinking. Um, I listen to them when I do laundry, when I do all the mundane stuff that you don't want to do right or oh god folding socks for kids ah i have a <laughs> i have a graveyard of socks where i don't know where they go <laughs> but um listening to podcasts reading books so key i love the do one thing that is so powerful because it's so digestible right and i think as competitive athletes if you're anything like me and I'm pretty sure, cause we've spoken off camera, like we want to eat the whole elephant because we're just so driven. And, and it's like, okay, calm your passion, start with one thing. And then it just, it's the ripple effect and it starts to go into all areas of your life. Let's talk about, um, this good, the good games. I had never good heard games. about it before, but so phenomenal. So you go, you go, so you go in this dark phase, you come out, you, you get back, you reintegrate into community, into sport, um, do, is this what comes next or on your journey or where does this come from? I love this vision and I feel like more people need to hear about it. I've told probably 10 people since we spoke. Oh, awesome. I love <laughs> and they, it. Yeah. And I'm like, we need to connect you because you need to contribute to the event. I've been telling, I love it. I love it. That, you know what? Scene. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've sports kind of been my life and, and, um, I've been involved in everything from production to helping with events and whatnot. And then, and then there was a talk of, you know, wanting to bring a a sporting event to where I live in the city of Guelph and, and, you know, just kind of talked about a few ideas and then came up with an idea of a multi-sport games, which I, I, you know, I've been to multi-sport games. Vancouver had a big multi-sport games in 2016. I was there for it. Can you tell people who are listening what that is? Multi-sport game, just for some that might not know what it is. Sure. Multi-sport games are basically like an Olympic games, but for, um, you know, Olympic games are multi-sport games for professional athletes. Um, then you have multi-sport games like the America's masters games, which are for athletes over 30. And they're basically a multiple, uh, multiple sports playing at the same time with like a big kind of Olympic feel and Olympic style festival and, um, a really cool concept. And, and we kind of had facilities here in Guelph that were perfect to host something like that. Cause they have multiple facilities, everything kind of within walking distance, and so we developed this idea to bring a, a big multi-sport event to Guelph. Uh, originally, it was a, a master's over 30, and now it's going to be over 20. Just we got too many requests from 20 to 30-year-olds. And it was basically about celebrating sport. And you know, part of it is the athlete's competition. You could be a former pro or you could be a recreational athlete. All levels play. We'll have all divisions. So, for example, last year we had a beach volleyball competition our elite division was former pros and Olympians and our fours divisions were rec to, to intermediate. It, it kind of runs the gamut. Mm-hmm. Um, you come at your level of play, the good stands for get out and outdo, get out and outdo yourself. That's all you're doing. Um, and then part of the, the games was also creating this like Olympic style festival, because when I've been to Olympics or big sporting events, the fun part is actually the festival. Like you get yeah. to experience that festival part. And so how do we bring this all together And we really saw it, you know, it was supposed to launch in 2020. And then of course we had COVID. So we launched um, in 2022 in a smaller event. And then last year we launched kind of our, our, what it's going to look like. And so we had multiple sports happening at the same time. And right in the middle of them within walking distance, we had this massive festival and I don't see anybody. I've not seen anybody in the world being able to do something like this because it's all within walking distance, all the sports competitions. And then the festival right in the middle where it's a festival of sport, you know, where you go to a music festival and it's a band playing Well, you come to ours and it's sports playing. Um, oh, so cool. we had, you know, a beach. it is so cool. And you, we had a you beach said volleyball court. July, right? I think July 5th, 6th yeah. and 7th of 2024. Yeah. It runs every year. We'll run it the weekend after Canada day. Love it. Um, kind of a good time where people, you know, kids are off school. If parents want to come kind of thing. Um, and the nice thing, I think we had some, I remember some athletes coming up to us last year and saying, well, this is so cool. My family came, but they don't have to hang out and watch me play sport. They can actually enjoy <laughs> the festival. Cause we had, we had obstacle courses. We had arm wrestling competitions. We had the freestyle soccer, Canadian championships. We had Love volleyball it. courts and stuff badminton court, court set up. We had professional beach uh, court set up with beach volleyball players. We had a beer garden, food trucks. I mean, it was just a really fun, exciting environment. I want to come. Um, I'm coming. <laughs> yeah, I think you should. It was so fun. And, you know, we really saw that uh, sport is such a great way to unite people. 
There's nothing mm-hmm. I think that unites more than sport for me. Like, I, mm-hmm. I guess that's just my, that's my background. And you could really see, you know, it's, it was cool to watch people coming there because nobody was on their phones. Like everybody was just experiencing. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just come and watch. You could do that. Yeah. It was come and experience, like get out there. And we had, you know, three-legged races, potato sack races. We kind of ran the gamut of everything we ran there. So there was something for everyone. You could be as involved as you wanted to be or as little involved, but I think we had, we had a CTV reporter come and do a story and she was just like, this is the coolest event <laughs> I've ever been to. I love She's it. Like, I've done events in the area and I'm like, it's, it's an experiential event. It's not just come and watch. You can do that, but you can also come experience. And I think that's what, you know, it's a, we're calling it the biggest festival of sport in Canada. It is the biggest festival of sport in Canada and you can come compete and partake that way, or you can just come to the festival, which is fun in itself. I love it. I, yeah, I'd never heard of it. And I definitely want to, uh, want to check it out. What maybe, what are some last words of advice? I'm, I always think about the person that's unable to share and they're suffering in silence. I, I had many years where I stuffed my, I, as vulnerable and emotional as a person I am, I still stuffed a lot down um, and hid, you know, my darkest thoughts and feelings away from the world. For the person that's watching that is, you know, in a dark headspace, I know you said to do one thing, but is there anything else that you would say, or would you love to tell your, what would your younger self that was going through that situation um, that I maybe haven't asked or we haven't touched on? What piece of advice would you have for someone? I mean, I think you, you've said lots of it. I think, um, we control our minds and we don't realize that. I feel like that's something we should be teaching kids from such a young age. Like if there was a course in classes I would teach, I would teach the power of mind and how to think because that's everything like your, your brain. And you, you don't, we don't even realize that we have the capacity to control it. Like that was a big lesson for me. Um, but I would infuse myself with, there are so many great talks. If you, if you don't want to go in and I was in that place, I didn't want to talk to anybody. Nobody knew. Like when I told people I'd gone through it, there were still people very close to me that were like, I had no idea. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, because I, I hit it very well. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, there's just, especially nowadays, there are so many resources. There's so much information. It's so easy to get on YouTube. And if you're struck, Google it, like, look at it, find a, a great, somebody that, that resonates with you. And, you know, uh, different people resonate, uh, with different talks and different speakers. And, uh, you know, I, I change all the time. Like yeah. I'm listening to Joe Dispenza right now, whereas, you know, before I was listening to Kyle Cease. And so, I mean, I just change depending on what I'm feeling, but there's so much great information out there about the mind and about, you know, shifting and about how to shift. Um, I also did one really cool challenge uh, that I thought was super fun. And I do it sometimes just to challenge myself, but I called it, I called it expand your experiences. And I, it's funny when I talk to people about it, they, they, they really resonate with it. But I basically challenged myself to in one summer, a couple of years ago to do, I remember I was challenging myself to do like 25 new things that summer that made me happy. And I remember thinking, oh my God, there's, that is no way I'm going to do 25. It's going to be so hard. Um, and as I got going on it, I remember it was hard at first. And then as I got rolling, it's funny, you get into a cycle and then you start to see things more, the more you, um, kind of get into this place where you're doing things that make you happy, the more you see them. So I would be driving home from, you know, a meeting in Burlington and I'd be on a back road and I'd see cars parked on the side of the road. And I remember thinking, I bet you there's a really cool trail there. I'm going <laughs> to stop. And that's going to be my I experience. And I documented a lot of it. And I'd be like, this is my 12th of my 25 experiences. I think I hear and a second TED where- talk coming. Uh, I- yeah, really. Eh? And I'll <laughs> tell you, it's so funny. There are some videos I did. I remember I stopped in Hamilton at one spot. I walked down this really crazy, you know, gravel road. And I came across this amazing piece of like water with trees and and it was like I was giddy and laughing and showing people like I'm like this is what you get when you just yeah. try and Curiosity. then and then you know what I ended up I ended up doing 50 25 turned 50 going. I didn't think I would do 25 so I mean I always love challenges because I feel like that makes me kind of do something and that's probably the athlete in the me competitive but I mean it, yeah but I, you know what's funny I mentioned it too I did a talk with these women and I, I sat with them and I said, well, you know, just think about what would, what's something you would want to do that you have always wanted to do and you just haven't done it. And, you know, some of them were like, I'd love to go horseback riding. And I'm like, well, then make that something that you try to do, because if that makes you happy, uh, that's all that matters. <laughs> As a little furball goes by the camera. I, I was just going <laughs> to see. <laughs> I got a cat walking. Yeah. <laughs> that's too funny. I but yeah, like, oh. I'd say. 
Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, What's that I little mean... bird running by there? <laughs> but you know what? Yeah. I think I think the thing that I've also realized is we always tend to look for ways to make ourselves happy when we're in a hole. And I feel like instead of waiting till you're in that hole, try doing things that make you happy when you're feeling good too. And yeah. then keep your, and listening to stuff. Like I remember I'd always wait till like I was in a crappy place to start listening to all these yeah. audio and Do podcasts. It even, even and on now the high? it's them every yeah. day. Yeah. Yeah. Like now I'm like every morning, it literally is what I put on in the morning. It's what I listen to uh, anytime. If I'm doing the dishes, I'm, I'm it. So now I'm just like, it just has to be there all the time instead of just when I need a perk. And do you meditate? Do you meditate? I do. I do a short meditation in the morning. First thing in the morning when I'm in that kind of theta wave still, um, just keep, you know, just look at my day, what I want it to be like. And, uh, and, you know, visualization, see, see the life you want and feel it. You know, it, Ooh, it's, I it's love that you just said tool. that feel it. Cause a lot of times feel it. there's goal setting, but it's like, let's feel, how do you want to feel? And then you write down what you need to do to feel that. Right. So you want to feel healthy. What do you have to do? You got to work out, eat well, da, da. a lot of people don't go by the feeling. They, they have this goal that they want, but they, I love that and the feeling and breaking it down. Another book that I was just talking about with an athlete, um, atomic habits, he was saying just like for those daily habits, it really helps you get perspective on, you know, let's peel back to like, what are we doing today? What are my, what's my intention today mm-hmm. to move me closer to that ideal feeling? And I love that it's destination happy, as you say, mm-hmm. with your TEDx talk. Um, well, I'm so grateful, Helen, that you uh, won to meet you because I'm like, oh gosh, thanks Ken of Rare for putting her on my path because yeah. um, we are very, <laughs> we are very similar. Um I love your, I can feel your energy through the, the computer screen. So thank you for that. I'm high energy. Too, so I'm like, this is a really good fun interview here. I'm I usually, you don't have some of the same level of intensity. So I love it. And, <laughs> um, thank you for your openness. Thank you for pushing through. I, I, you know, I really believe in, if you can see her, you can be here And for our younger athletes that are up and coming, seeing, you know, you can accomplish and you can go through hard things and you can come out and you can still continue to learn and you can still suffer from confidence issues, even when you've achieved a lot. So it's just really help. I <laughs> <laughs> your cat getting her love, around that's me. okay you're getting a little dusting while, while we're on <laughs> show everyone who's there My Yay! <laughs> what's it, his or her name yeah uh, she's uh isabella isabella hi isabella <laughs> um well it was a pleasure having you and isabella on on the transitioning <laughs> to life after sports series um episode 38 everyone this is I don't want to butcher your last name. Helen Stumbos. Yeah. Did I say it right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Correct. (laughs) Perfect. Um, And for those of you that are tuning in, this was episode 38. There's a whole list of professional athletes on my YouTube channel. You can go like subscribe, but if we just transform one life and listening to this today, they are all worth it. And I'm just so grateful that you came forward to share your story with us. Thanks for having me anytime. Yeah. See you at the games. See you at yeah, the games. Exactly. Right? I'm super excited for that. <laughs> we'll see you soon. Okay. Bye bye.